One of the things that became necessary as Serve the World sort of gained momentum was creating um, a structure to it. First of all, you need accountability for the funds that are coming in. You need decision making for how they're going to be used. And then part of that was creating a, a Serve the World committee. So there's four others that brood over these decisions every six months. That team that Bruce leads, they vet the financial accountability of the ministry, they vet everything about that ministry before we decide to commit funds. So this team comes out of the room together, unified on each of the decisions, with excitement and confidence in how we are re-stewarding the generosity of Chapel Street Church. So each gift that is given to serve the world leaves Chapel Street Church. All funds are redistributed across the street and around the world. Huge to understand that. We don't keep any of it. Secondly, it's always going to make a gospel impact and make Jesus famous. And then finally, each gift is given with the vision that it's not dependent on us. That ministry will continue because we just help them get over a big hurdle, but the sustainability of that ministry is going to be well beyond the cashing of the check that we send them. What I've realized is the relationships that grow in Serve the World partnerships are with people. And as you spend time with people, you, you discover their hearts. And your heart starts to beat for the things that their heart beats for. My name is Michelle Claceris, and I have been serving on the board for Caring Network Aurora since 2021. Chapel Street Church highlighted Caring Network for our Serve the World, and I was not familiar with them before that, but God had already been prompting my heart, stirring a desire in my heart to serve in a new way. Hearing about the work of Caring Network mattered to me because I want women who are abortion-minded, those who are setting out to seek out an abortion, to find a clinic. I want her to know that there are people that love her, that care about her, that care about the baby. When our team looks at applications, a lot of time what grabs our heart is realizing that if we were able to give to them at this very moment, it would be a breakthrough for their ministry impact. Chapman Street Church was extremely generous. They were able to raise $250,000, and we are incredibly grateful to our Chapel Street family. What we were able to do with those $250,000 is actually two clinics. One is set up for Austin, just outside the city of Chicago, and then one in the city of Aurora, and that's the one that I have the joy of serving with. Each of the Serve the World partners has a story. The, the human trafficking space was one that was mind-blowing to a guy in his mid-40s when Naomi's house approached us. And I discovered that human trafficking was in the United States and it was in the western suburbs. It was on Randall Road. My name is Simone Halpin. I'm the executive director and co-founder of Naomi's House. We believe that every woman who's been commercially sexually exploited deserves a new start. In the last seven years since we started serving women, we have grown from serving five women through our residential program to having three programs in four locations throughout the Chicagoland area. And as we finished 2023, we have served 194 women. I think this story represents to me obviously and very clearly God's faithfulness. But something that we say all the time at Naomi's house that we believe and that we, we witness happen in the lives of the women we serve is that it takes an entire community to come alongside a woman's life after it's been shattered from exploitation and trafficking. And Chapel Street demonstrated that. They said, we believe in the mission of Naomi's house. We believe in the dignity of women. We believe in the restoration of someone's life that has experienced such evil. Simone helped me get her heart for women that were being trafficked. As we continue to serve the world, my hope is that Chapel Streeters will grasp one of the stories, one of the relationships, and individually figure out how they can be a part of the story. I'll tell you, one of the great joys of uh, being in the role that I get to be in is getting to tell you the stories of what God is doing through your generosity. Uh, last week, we showed you the beginning of Serve the World, how it started 10 years ago. 
that we took the missions giving out of our general fund budget and say, what if God could do more? And he has been faithful to do that through the generosity of his people over a decade. If you've been a part of Chapel Street, you know every year at Advent, we typically pick one partner, one Serve the World partner, and tell you their compelling story, ask you to pray for them, encourage you to give to them, and uh, to, for a significant project. We've done, we, bu we built a center in Aurora, helped pay for that for a caring network. We've dug uh, wells, built schools, uh, done all kinds of things through uh, the generosity of God's people here. This year, we thought, we want to tell you the bigger story, because that's just one partner we're picking each Advent of what God does through Serve the World as a whole. You heard a couple of those stories, Carrie Network and Naomi's House. Next week, we'll tell you a couple more specific stories. The goal this year is to raise $300,000 this year at Advent, last week and this week and the two weeks to come, to be ready to give to our partners in the new year. As Pastor Bruce mentioned, we give all of it away. We keep none of it. And it's such a, it's such a joy to bless. Have you, have you ever been in a situation where you prayed and somebody did something that was the direct answer to your prayer? Like it was like, that, that, that's the, what I prayed. We get to be that for these partners. We get to be the answer to their prayers for God's provision. We say God provides. Well, how does he provide? Well, most of the time he provides through the generosity of his people, which is us. So anyway, if God moves in your heart, give to serve the world above and beyond your regular giving. All that money is, is, will be compiled to give away to our partners, and we'll be telling you those stories all the way into 2024. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your grace in our lives all seasons, but especially this season. It's a busy season. It's full of lots of distractions and fun. But we pause now to acknowledge that you are the giver of all good gifts. And the greatest gift is the gift of your son. And it's for his sake that we think about serving the world. Because you, Lord Jesus, said that you came not to be served, but to serve and to give your life. Scripture tells us that it was for us and our salvation that you came down. So we praise you and we thank you in your name. Amen. Uh, last week, my, uh, my wife, my daughter, and my youngest son and I went to the Morton Arboretum uh, to, uh, to see the, the lighting of the trees, the, uh, they call it the illumination or whatever. I wasn't a fan of the $700.50 hot chocolate, but I have to be honest, the, the show was pretty good. The, 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 the experience was, was pretty impressive. See a picture of us here on the screen, uh, well, part of my son's face anyway, uh, with the lights there. And they, they, you walk around, there's music playing, it's all coordinated, there's lots of people there, uh, but it was really pretty impressive. The, was, I took, snapped this photo of here of the trees being lit up. Uh, they light the, it's not very good, you can get better ones on the internet, but anyway. Uh, the, the trees lighting up different colors, it was really pretty Pretty powerful. How many of you have ever, have you been there? Anybody been to the Arboretum for the show? Yeah. How many of you have at one time in your life driven around looking at Christmas lights? Anybody? Yeah. Why? What is it about this time of year and lights that we love so much? Like we don't drive around to look at lights any other time of the year. What, what is it about a dark night or middle of the day in December that we want to drive around and look at lights? What, what is it about lights? In the, maybe it's because it gets so dark so early and stays dark so long this time of year that a little light makes us feel better. But we could be thankful. We don't live in the Norwegian town of, of uh, uh, I forgot, uh, Ryukon. Ryukon, Norway. Here's a picture of Ryukon, Norway. It is known as the darkest city on earth because the position of the sun is very, very low and the position of the, the town is at the bottom of a steep mountain valley. So for six months, no direct sunlight reaches this town. There are places in Alaska that only get a few hours of direct sunlight, but for six months, from September to March, every year, there's no direct sunlight that reaches this town. How would you like to live there? Until 2013, when a group of physicists had an experiment, they built what they call the sun mirrors. The giant sun mirrors on a, on a hillside, on a mountain, you can see them up there reflecting. I don't think it's working very well, frankly. But anyway, that's the town center and the mirror to give them some sunlight. There is a deeper spiritual significance to this idea of light and darkness from the Bible's perspective. It's all over the story of Advent and Christmas. Advent is the story of light coming into the world, of hope. But as Fleming Rutledge said in her, one of her essays and sermons on Advent, and I mentioned this last week, Advent begins in the dark. Advent is ultimately a story about hope and light, but it begins in the dark. And this is how the story of John uh, tells the story of Jesus, how it begins. John's prologue to his gospel begins by talking about light and darkness. We read it last week. We'll read it again this week. I want you to stand together 
for the reading of God's word from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is God's word. You may be seated. You can hear the theme throughout, can't you? Light and darkness. Seven times in 14 verses, light is mentioned in contrast with darkness. The true light, the light of life, the light that gives life, coming into the world, shining in a darkness. A darkness of a world full of injustice and war and poverty. Part of the reason we do serve the world is to shed the light of God's grace, the hope of the gospel into different parts of the world. And the darkness in our own minds and hearts at times, the darkness of our own sin, of our own failure, of our own fear. Fleming Rutledge again writes, Advent is the right time for asking the hard questions. It is not tolerable, she writes, to speak of light unless we are willing to look squarely into the face of the darkness of of our world. One of the things I love about the Bible, and if you're new to studying the Bible, welcome, uh, I, I love about the Bible is the Bible doesn't sugarcoat this. It doesn't, uh, doesn't gloss over the darkness of the world. It doesn't pretend like it doesn't exist. It isn't an idealized or sanitized version of things. It faces it squarely, sometimes so squarely that it makes us squirm a little bit. But in doing that, it's able to point us to the light. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. You'll know this. Uh, we read this every year at this time. In Isaiah chapter 9, the prophet Isaiah writes about this. Light coming to darkness is what John is drawing on. But there will be no gloom for who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the later time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. The Old Testament tells the story of God's people as um, God, in the beginning, right? God said, let there be light. Prior to that, there was no light. There was, the earth was formless and void. Darkness hovered over everything until God spoke and there was light. He himself is the light. All other lights are derivative. And he's continually given his people his light. The light of the witness of the prophets, the light of uh, the revelation of his law, his word, And our story, from the Old Testament to this day, is that we turn away. We resist. We prefer darkness at times. We rebel. And God, again, keeps coming to his people with a little more light. This is the image John is drawing on when he writes about uh, that the light has come into the world. A light that reaches all the way back to the very beginning of creation and stretches all the way into eternity. A light that no darkness will ever dispel or overcome. This is the theme imagery. Look again at John chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. This was true 2,000 years ago on a dark night on a hillside outside of a little city called Bethlehem. The group of shepherds huddled together when the light of heaven burst in upon them. And they trembled with fear. The angel said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news. The light is good news of great joy. And it's still true today. Last Sunday, between services, I had a chance to pray with a young woman who the light of Christ was breaking into her heart for the first time understanding who Jesus is. 
that God made her, that God loves her, that God died for her. What a privilege to see the light that we're, we're talking about. God's still shining his light into our hearts. So I think it's worth your time to ponder what is the light. I'm gonna ask three questions about the light. Who is it? What is the purpose of it? And how should we respond to it? Who, what, and how? Ready? Who is the light? You know this one, but I think it's worth pondering this a bit. Not what is the light, but who? Last week we looked at the word, the logos, the, the, the principle behind all of the universe. That there's an order and a harmony and a principle behind everything. But it's not an impersonal philosophy or force. It is the man, Jesus Christ. He is the logos. Well, the light also comes from him. He is the light. John talks about the light coming into the world. He's talking about a person coming into the world. The man, Jesus Christ. Look at verses 9 and, and, uh, of, of chapter 1 in, in John 8, verse 12. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He's speaking about Jesus Christ, the Word. And then in John 8, Jesus says of himself, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Later this spring, we're going to do a whole series on the I am statements of Jesus, leading all the way up to Easter, and this is one of them. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. All other lights are derivative lights. He's the source of light. Every other light, including the power of our own sun, is a reflected light, a created light, a light that has its source somewhere else. That's true physically, cosmologically, and spiritually. Je interesting about this statement, Jesus said this during the Jewish festival of tabernacles, or booths, as some of your Bibles may say. In, in this uh, great feast, one of the great feasts of the Jewish uh, culture and, here, and religion, uh, begin, uh, ends, culminates with, with the lighting of the temple. There are these massive, uh, four massive 75-foot-high menorahs, candle stands, lamp stands, huge. And they were, they were all lit. And they, it was said that, that the light from those four massive lamp stands from the Temple Mount would give light to every corner of every street in the city of Jerusalem. I don't know if that's true. I've never seen it. But the point is, Jesus picks this time to say, I am the light of the world. This has all been what you celebrate every year and what you pray for and long for. It's all been about me. That's what John is declaring to us. That he, God has turned the lights on in Jesus. This has all been about me. Think about this. I think about this every year in I think about John 8, verse 12, every year when, when we start putting up the lights. When I get out my Christmas lights and find out which ones don't work. And I, send, I sent my son to buy some Christmas lights. <laughs> I said, just get as many as you can. Well, he did. If he went to Menards, I'm sorry, it's our fault. They don't have any more. We bought them all. <laughs> I think about the putting up lights and the, and the enjoyment of them. What is it about that stirs our hearts? Ultimately, it's what Jesus is saying. He is the light of the world. Okay, so second question. What's the purpose of the light? What is the purpose of the light? John says the true light that gives light to everyone is coming into the world. Well, what does light do? Even from a scientific point of view, uh, the question of what is light is a difficult one to answer. Maybe some of you physicists might know this. Electromagnetic radiation, which is seen on a very limited spectrum of waves that, waves that we can perceive with our eyes. There's red light, there's infrared light, there's violet light, there's ultraviolet light, there are gamma rays, there are different kinds of light. And the speed of light is, anybody know? 186,000 miles per second and change. You probably know these. I know you know the exact number, right? Almost all the information in the universe that we know comes to us through observable light. That which comes to us as electromagnetic, ra electromagnetic radiation. That's how we know things about the universe. Light wouldn't exist if there was not the energy and light of the sun. But for most of us, if unless we're a physicist, we don't really know about that. We just know when you flip the switch, the lights come on, right? We know that, that, that I need light to be able to see. So I'm not groping and stumbling around in the dark. Well, first thing we see, light reveals truth. Light reveals truth. Jesus is the light and the truth. We know this. We know truth by his light. Like, the truth is an interest. We could spend a lot of time on this. But in our culture today, truth is a debated topic. Is there such a thing as an objective, universal standard of truth? When, when we say things like, that, that is wrong. That ought not to be. That it ought to be different. 
we shouldn't whatever. All of us would agree that the, the, the human trafficking is wrong. We should not enslave people and traffic them. Why? By what standard? What, what are we appealing to? Where's the source of truth? Where do we get that from? We might say the Word of God. We learned last week that Jesus is himself the Word. That th this is the rev revelation of him. My, the point John is making is that light reveals truth, and Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the light by which we understand what truth is. He's the objective standard, the measuring stick, by which we even talk about what ought to be, what ought not to be. Light reveals truth. John chapter 1, verse 5 again. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Some translations say understood it. The psalmist writes, Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Well, John 1, 5 is the answer to the prayer of Psalm 43. Sh shine your light on my life, in my life, Lord Jesus. Oh God, well, he has. This means we don't, you don't have to pray and ask God to give you light. He has given it to you in Jesus Christ. He is the light. Turn to him, see him, and see by him. Jesus becomes the lens of truth for our lives by which we see. One of my favorite authors, you'll know who it is. Yes, C.S. Lewis. I uh, wrote, wrote um, a number of things. Before we get to this quote, I, um, I, I just want to read you a little portion of an essay that is not well known, but I love. It's called Meditation in a Tool Shed. Lewis writes about being in a tool shed uh, on a, uh, a, a fall afternoon. And he's in the dark tool shed. And there's a beam of light coming through the crack in the door above. You can imagine this, right? And he can see the sunbeam coming through the crack in the door above and illuminating part of the tool shed. Can you just imagine it in your mind's eye? Like dust particles floating in the, in the sunbeam of light. And he says, I'm looking at the beam of sunlight. I'm looking at it. I'm examining the beam of light. He says, then I moved. I shifted my physical you know, aspect, perspective, so that I'm not looking at the beam, but I'm looking along the beam. Out, and here's what he writes about that. I was standing today in the dark tool shed. The sun was shining outside through the crack at the top of the door. There came in a sunbeam. From where I stood, that beam of light with the specks of dust floating in it was the most striking thing in the whole place. Everything else was almost pitch black. I was seeing the beam, but not seeing things by it. Then I moved, so the beam fell on my eyes. Instantly, the whole previous picture vanished. I saw no tool shed, and above all, no beam. Instead, I saw framed in the irregular cranny at the top of the door green leaves moving on the branches of a tree outside. And beyond that, 90-odd million miles away, the sun itself. Looking along the beam and looking at the beam are different experiences. Are you following with him? There's one, we, we, we do not stand at a distance and look at Jesus. Oh, I guess I could, I could know certain things about him from a distance. He is the light by which we see. We see along him, by him, through him, into the world. This is what Lewis writes in a different essay in Christian Reflections. I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. That's, I think, what John is getting at when he says Christ is the light. Do you see him and the world through him, by him? Light reveals truth. Second, light dispels darkness. Light, uh, what, is, what is darkness after all but the absence of light? The message of Advent is that in Jesus, God has turned the lights on. He's shown light into our lives. John chapter 3, verse 19, puts it this way, the image of turning the lights on in Christ. He says, this is the judgment. Light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. We worked on that, by the way, in pre, and I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> First John 1, verse 5, puts it to us this way. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Psalm 18, 28 puts it this way. 
For it is you who light my lamp. The Lord my God lightens my darkness. Now, I, uh, I, I can't think of that story or those images without thinking of the story of um, taking a missions trip to the Rose, south side of Chicago, Roseland community many, many years ago when I was a high school pastor. We were sleeping in a church basement and next to us was the food storage for their, for their pantry. Um, and uh, I was not sleeping very well. It was a sleeping bag on a hard linoleum tile uh, church basement, smelled kind of funky in there. Anyway, I got up and turned the lights on because I couldn't find my way out to the passage of the bathroom. And I turned the switch on just like a minute ago and I saw out of the corner of my eye dozens of cockroaches just going <laughs> scattering for cover. Yeah, I had the same reaction. You know, yeah, you know, we're all sleeping on the floor surrounded by these things. The lights go on and <laughs> they disappear. Well, the, the witness of Scripture is that the truth about us is there darkness not just outside of us but in us. And if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we run from the light. We scurry for cover. We want to hide and cover up. But we don't have to fear the light. Or the dark, for that matter. Because Jesus Christ is the light. Martin Luther King Jr. puts it this way, Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. The same is true with fear and with shame. Only light the light of the love of Christ can drive that away. Third, light restores life. Now, this image, life, is next week's whole sermon, so we won't give too much away there. But John chapter 1, verse 4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. You'd think it might be the other way around. Light and light becomes life. That's our series, Light and Life. But in him is life. The whole purpose of John's gospel is that we might believe in Christ, and by believing, have life in his name. And that life is the light, the life that is found in him. John 17, verse three, and this is eternal life, that, you, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now again, we're giving too much away. We'll get to that a little later on. But John 20, verse 31, simply puts it this way. It's the purpose statement for all of John's gospel, and really, frankly, all of the Bible. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing, have life in his name. Not so that you be inspired. Not so that you can build your best life through your own effort and have a little God in your life. But you might believe that he is who he said he is. And in him find light in life. Okay, last. How then should we respond to the light? What's our response? Well, we find the answers to that question uh, in this little interlude in the first uh, uh, section of John's gospel. We read it a few moments ago. John chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. This John has, the, it sounds almost like a change of subject, but it's not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Pause there. John is not writing about himself. He's referring to you. Anybody know? John the Baptist. John the Baptizer. J.B. Okay, so this is not John the, the apostle. John, the author of the gospel. This is John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Why is that important? I want you to notice two words in that passage that answer the question, how should we respond to the light? They are the word believe and the word bear witness. He came to bear witness. Why? That all would believe. Our response is to believe and to bear witness. If you're wondering, what's the point of Jesus? Okay, Jesus is the light. I get the light of the world. What does that mean for me? Believe in him and bear witness to him. These three verses are referring to uh, uh, John the Baptist's unique, specific role. Jesus said in Matthew 11 that of those born of women, uh, nobody's greater than John. Pretty high praise. In John 5, Jesus will say of John the Baptist, he was a burning, shining lamp. Jonathan Edwards, in his commentary about this passage, says, well, burning refers to uh, the inner passion for God, inner passion and desire for Christ. And shining refers to outward witness. Perhaps I like to think of it that way. But to be a witness for Christ, there needs to be a genuine desire for him, love for him, commitment to him. And that is what's shining he understood, John, two things clearly. Number one, God sent him. 
And number two, he's not the light. My, one of my favorite uh, sports movies, the movie Rudy. Anybody seen Rudy? Of Rudy Rudiger, unfortunate name, but a uh, good story. He's praying in the, ch- in the chapel, do you remember this? To get into Notre Dame. He's lighting candles. He's wondering if he's done, wondering if he's done enough. And uh, an old priest comes in and he says, Father, have I, have I done enough? Is, is God going to answer my prayer? And the old priest says, Son, in over 40 years of religious study, I've, only learned, I've learned only two incontrovertible truths. Number one, there is a God. Number two, I am not him. Right? John got that one right. I am not the light. He says it over and over again. I'm not the light. Behold the Lamb of God. He must increase. I must decrease. He understood that his purpose was not about himself. I, we have such a tendency in our culture, I, I, I see this all the time, even in my own life too, to look to somebody else to be our light, to find some hero out there. We idolize pastors and public speakers and evangelists and world leaders and stars on film or in music or on the field of competition looking to them to be some sort of light for us, a model for how we ought to be. And I'm not saying we shouldn't find good examples, but very often the best examples might be down the street from us, not on the screen. But the point of the gospel is, Christ is the light. Don't replace him with some lesser derivative light. What a tragedy if you look to some, some diminished light when you have him. John got that right. There is only one light. I'm not the light. You are not the light. Jesus is the light. Some of you might be thinking, well, didn't Jesus say you're the light of the world? We'll get to that. Hang on. Most of us would agree that John the Baptist was a great man of faith, a unique person in salvation history, a man of courage and conviction. But I'm going to guess if you knew him, you probably might be a little uncomfortable inviting him to your Christmas party. John lived a life that would make most of us feel a little bit uneasy or anxious. I mean, the guy was intense. He lived out in the wilderness, and people flocked to see him, but uh, he didn't exactly, uh, he wasn't the, the king of social circles because he was singular in his focus, singularly focused on Christ and his mission to bear witness to Christ. Now, you and I are not John the Baptist. We don't have that same exact unique role in salvation history. But the Bible's clear If you belong to Jesus, you are sent and you are to bear witness to the light of Christ in the world. You do share that. Acts chapter one, verse eight says that Jesus says to his disciples and all of his followers, you will be my witnesses. God still sends and calls witnesses to the light of his love in Christ. That is what we are to be. Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16 puts it this way. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Well, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say that he is the light of the world? Well, how can he say that we are the light of the world? Well, if anybody can say it, he can say it, because to the degree that we reflect his light, we are derivative lights, right? He's the source. To the degree that we live in obedience to his word, proclaim the truth of his gospel, we are indeed the light of the world. We're intended to be. Jesus says in John 20 to his disciples, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you to bear witness There's a lot of criticism these days about the church for how we're doing in our light shining and witness bearing. There's a lot of talk about how Christians get it wrong. I hear a lot of that. Perhaps you do as well. Nevertheless, God intended and decided in his wisdom that the way people would see the light is through a witness. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, one of my favorite passages in the New Testament. Peter's writing to a church, to us. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness 
into his marvelous light. That you may proclaim. Belief doesn't come out of nowhere. Belief in Christ does not happen in a vacuum. How does it happen? Well, there are unusual circumstances. We hear stories about uh, people across the, the, in a different part of the world seeing Christ in a vision. I have a good friend named John Kelly, he's preached here before, who was just read scripture in a prison cell. And the light of Christ shone into the darkness of that cell in his heart. God does that. But from the beginning, God's primary plan for how people would believe is what? Huh? How would somebody come to believe that Jesus Christ is the light? It's not a trick question. I could stand here all morning. Yes, if, you, if we tell them. It's been God's vision and plan from the beginning that the way people would know the light is that there would be witnesses to the light. John the Baptist's unique role pointing to him and all of his followers since to believe and to bear witness. Some of you, you're here and you're being called to believe. You've been looking at the beam, you know, from a distance. Jesus is pretty cool. But God is calling you to let that beam flood into your heart. Forgive your sin, set you free, give you new life to believe, to truly believe and receive the forgiveness and life that he offers. Many of you are here and you already believe, but you need to be reminded that you also need to bear witness. We are, that's our response to the light. Jesus is the light of the world we sing. We go around and look at lights. What, for what reason? That I might believe he's a light in my life and to bear witness to his light. Let's pray together. Father, we, we confess to you that there is darkness in this world in our own hearts. And some here are facing darkness of, of their past, shame, darkness of, of things around them. But we also are encouraged, Lord, by your word that there is no darkness that you cannot dispel, that you cannot drive away and cast out. For those here this morning, Lord, who are called to believe, to come to see and know that you, Lord Jesus, are the light of the world and the light of their own life, I pray that they would not run from the darkness, but run straight to you, the light, and find forgiveness and freedom in you. And for all of us who believe, who already believe, Lord, you've called us to bear witness into this dark world that we would reflect your light. We thank you, Jesus, that you have turned the lights on in our hearts, in our lives, through our lives, and in this world. We pray this in your name and for your sake and glory. Amen. Perhaps you're here this morning and you're in need of someone to pray for you and pray with you. Uh, perhaps you, even you're ready to say, yes, I, I, want, I want the light of Christ in my own life. We have members of our prayer team every week that are available in the prayer room right outside to meet with you and encourage you through prayer. But for all of us, may we go now in the grace, mercy, and love of the Lord Jesus, the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light so that we may proclaim his excellencies. To him be glory and honor now and forever. Amen. And go in peace.